All right, welcome to lecture number 37. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about uh, sedatives which are used to treat insomnia, uh, those that are used to induce anesthesia, and then we'll talk a little bit about drugs used to prevent seizures, and then finally, I'm going to wrap up this section on sedatives with a short discussion of a drug called propanolol, uh, which may have some utility in treating post-traumatic stress disorder. Let's start with some of the FDA-approved hypnotics for insomnia. There are, of course, some uh, benzodiazepines used in this particular class. These are schedule uh, four narcotics. You can see um, temazepam, triazolam, uh, and some other drugs in this class are oftentimes approved for this particular use. Off-label uses for Xanax are used in this class as well. Uh, the benzodiazepine agonists, or what we call non-benzodiazepine ag agonists, or BZRAs, um, are ones that you're probably more familiar with, which include Sonata, Ambien, and Lunesta. We'll talk a little bit about um, a melatonin ag agonist, uh, and then I'm going to finish out this section with some alternatives as well as over-the-counter drugs used to treat insomnia. So we'll start with these non-benzodiazepine benzodiazepine receptor agonists. Probably familiar with most of these drugs, Zolpidem or Ambien, Ambien CR, and some other brand names uh, are used for uh, treatment of insomnia. And in fact, Ambien is probably the most commonly used in this class. Uh, it's important to understand that daytime and dose related impairment can occur, and there are a lot of concerns uh, of use of this particular drug in the elderly. Uh, Ambien and the rest of the drugs in this class have been associated with um, what's called sort of uh, Ambient-induced sleepwalking, uh, it's actually what's happening is just like the other benzodiazepines, these drugs have negative effects on memory, and so what's often happening is people are doing things but not remembering them prior to this drug finally uh, getting its full kick in. You should also know that Ambient is associated with hallucinations in some people, uh, and being one of those people, I can tell you it's very bizarre. Um, but you can actually hallucinate under, uh, under the influence of these drugs, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, Sonata, another uh, drug in this class, induces sleep much more rapidly. Uh, it lacks those negative effects on driving and motor abilities and has less dependence uh, and abuse potential, but does have abuse at potential at extremely high doses. Then finally, Lunesta. Um, it has the most prolonged action and most maybe the most preferable for sleep latency and maintenance. One of the problems that people have with Ambien is oftentimes it wears off too quickly, which is why they have the Ambien continuous release formulation uh, to try to keep people asleep longer. Uh, Lunesta is a little bit better for sleep latency and maintenance. The melatonin receptor agonist, I'm just going to talk about Rosaram. It's a selective melatonin receptor agonist. Um, melatonin is re regulated by the pineal gland on a 24-hour cycle-ish, um, which is reset by light and some other factors. The levels of our melatonin tend to increase towards bedtime. This particular drug is non-addictive. It has very modest effects in controlled trials, not super effective. Uh, the sleep onset is only about 10 to 15 minutes earlier than placebo. So it may not really be all that worthwhile, but it does seem to be somewhat effective in this case. The problem is it has little effect on total sleep time. And that's the biggest problem most of us have is total sleep time. In particular, I know um, I have a tendency to be awake for a couple hours in the middle of the night. Some alternative treatments for ins insomnia uh, include melatonin supplements. Uh, they do appear to be safe and effective for things like jet lag, shift work sleep disorders, and del delayed sleep phase disorder in which you're trying to sort of reset your biological clock. But otherwise, it's best to try to naturally reg regulate your melatonin levels by getting some sunshine early in the day and limit light exposure two hours before bedtime. Um, and that's obviously not something everyone can do, but uh, it's certainly one of the best ways to try to regulate this particular effect. CBD oils, um, there is some evidence that they may benefit those with sleep disorders. Um, and certainly there is emerging evidence for the efficacy of using CBD oils to treat anxiety, which is a common cause of insomnia. And so it may be that the CBD oils are, are effective in treating anxiety, which then uh, alleviates the insomnia. And we talked about this in previous lectures. We'll finish out this section by talking about over-the-counter sleep aids. 
almost all of these drugs contain diphenhydramine or Benadryl. And so what I tell most people is if, this is, if you feel like you need an occasional sleep aid, just buy some generic Benadryl rather than bothering with, you know, Tylenol PM or Advil PM or any of those other type of drugs because they all just are Advil plus the, you know, diphenhydramine or Tylenol plus diphenhydramine. Um, I do want to say uh, these can be effective in occasionally helping you get to sleep. Uh, this is an antihistamine with strong anticholinergic properties. Again, should be used sparingly. This shouldn't be used uh, daily. It certainly can be associated with increased daytime sleepiness the next day. And I do want to caution this drug should not be used in dementia patients. Um, the, uh, this drug has a strong anticholinergic property, and most dementia patients are taking uh, an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor um, to try to improve their cognitive functioning. And this is going to completely block the efficacy of that and can really set them into some very difficult um, and increased dementia um, symptoms. That gets us then to the anesthetics. Again, this will be fairly short um, and to the point. The general anesthetics are central nervous system depressants. They produce unconsciousness for surgery. Uh, generally, these are administered through either inhalation or injection. Um, inhaled anesthetics, um, such as nitrous oxide, are subject to abuse. It's really the only inhaled anesthetic in this class that has much abuse potential. Not a lot of people out um, huffing halothane because really you just end up unconscious. Nitric oxide, of course, is also available with things like whippets, that sort of thing. So it does have some potential for abuse. There are anesthetics that involve very significant GABA agonism, in particular the ultra-short-acting barbiturates we talked about earlier, uh, thiopental and brevitol. The drug that's used most often in surgery is propofol. Of course, this gained a lot of notoriety when Michael Jackson died. Um, structurally very similar to GABA. In fact, um, almost entirely mimics GABA. So it, the mechanisms involved here are the facilitation of the GABA A receptors. Uh, the important thing about uh, these drugs is they have very little analgesic or euphoric activity, so very little potential for abuse, except for, of course, in people who are trying to have themselves go to sleep every night. Um, and so that's a very unusual case uh, in the case of Michael Jackson. But these drugs are used um, every day, and it's the kind of go-to drug for uh, their onset's immediate um, and um, pretty quick um, acting as well as quick... Uh, um, elimination. So pretty effective in that area. All right, so that's anesthesia. We're going to turn next and talk a little bit about anti-epileptic drugs currently approved by the FDA. This is the whole list of these uh, and when they have been um, approved for epilepsy. We're going to talk quite a bit about a number of these drugs in upcoming lectures on bipolar disorder. Primarily, these drugs are used to prevent or acutely treat seizures. Uh, these are also often successful in treating bipolar disorders, I just mentioned, explosive behavioral disorders, alcohol withdrawal and cravings, in certain pain states. And we'll talk about some of these drugs and their use in peripheral neuropathy. Uh, they do have some use in certain anxiety disorders, PTSD and generalized anxiety disorders, as well as elements, again, of bipolar disorder. One thing I do want to mention is these drugs do have significant risk for pregnant mothers. There are higher rates of stillbirth and infant mortality exist for mothers with epilepsy. So mothers on these drugs have uh, increased incidence of birth defects. Now, I'll we'll mention here in a minute they're relatively rare, but before pregnancy, you should determine whether or not you can discontinue medication. Otherwise, manage doses as safely as possible. Oftentimes, people with severe epilepsy that's a significant risk factor of seizure because people can die from seizures. And so we want to be very cautious of that. 90% uh, of women with epilepsy have uneventful pregnancies in normal children. So we want to be cautious, but certainly talk with your doctor about it uh, if this is a concern. One other issue with this area and this class of drugs is there are risks of suicidal thoughts and behavior. In 2008, the FDA added a uh, warning that the use of these drugs may increase risk of suicidal thoughts and behaviors. That was challenged by some in the medical community because other factors were not considered. Um, but basically, essentially, the current recommendations are uh, increased pharmacovigilance to monitor 
or emerging suicidality. So keeping an eye on patients, checking in with them, making sure that they're safe uh, is all part of this treatment profile. So it's very important to keep that in mind. But finally, or sorry, I want to round out uh, this discussion of um, sedatives with some discussion of some novel treatments for PTSD. In particular, the drug propanolol, which is also the drug Indrol, is a beta blocker which releases, uh, blocks the release of norepinephrine. So people, well, not entirely, but blocks the release of norepinephrine. Um, and what's interesting about this is investigators have successfully used propanolol to eliminate phobias. And the way this works is that every time you retrieve a memory, it gets reconsolidated. So, in fact, one of the things as a cognitive psychologist I talk with my students about is uh, what's called the testing effect. And so every time you retrieve a memory, um, you reconsolidate that memory or can actually strengthen that memory. But what also happens is it allows that memory to be opened up and altered a bit. And so what happens is um, when those memories are reconsolidated under the influence of propanolol, it takes out that fear component. Uh, and so in particular, um, what we've seen in uh, some interesting work on phobias is the elimination of that phobia because it disconnects that norepinephrine release from the stimulus. So the stimulus, say if it's a spider phobia, um, the person interacts with a spider, usually a tarantula, uh, then they're given propanolol, and what happens is that memory gets reconsolidated without that norepinephrine part of that. So it disconnects that affective component. So there's evidence that this technique may be partially effective uh, shortly after a traumatic effect. Uh, uh, sorry, a traumatic event. And so under the influence of propanolol, um, or sorry, given uh, after a traumatic event, uh, it's possible that this drug might be used to block the formation of PTSD. Long-term treatment may be effective for others, and so there's some um, emerging work going on in this area. There's a really interesting video called Memory Hackers. It's from the PBS series Nova. Uh, and within that is a section uh, on this particular technique in using propanolol to eliminate phobia. So I encourage you to take a look at that. All right, that finishes our discussion of sedatives. We will pick up with drugs to treat bipolar disorder in the next set of lectures.